Well, we're back for round two on Moshe's birthday, May 6th, in the Feldenkrais Awareness Summit. Cynthia Allen here, as if you didn't know that by now, and we're having our final talk in the Deeper Feldenkrais Teachings track. But I want to remind you, just in case you've not found chat before, to be adventuresome and look around on your device for a chat option. Arlene Klein is over there introducing herself, and she will help moderate the conversation. We do encourage you to talk with each other, introduce yourselves, make new friends. And when we have our panel discussion right after this session, we will be taking some of the information from the three prior chats that associated with the three prior conversations, interviews, as well as the live chat during the panel discussion and folding that in. So feel free to uh, start having a little chit chat over there. And, um, that panel discussion, just to remind you, will be with Alan Quistel and Donna Ray and myself. So at 1.15 1 Eastern Daylight Time. So in just, just a little over an hour. So it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Elizabeth Berenger. She's been involved in the Feldenkrais Method for more than 40 years. She trained directly with Moshe Feldenkrais in both the United States and Israel. She's maintained an ongoing and very diverse practice, and she's also been a martial artist since 1977 in Aikido and currently holds the rank of six degree black belt. She was an instructor for many, many years at San Diego Aikikai, is that it? Aikikai? Am I close? Yeah, in San Diego. She has been a part of Feldenkrais Resources, which has really provided a huge bonus of information on the Feldenkrais Method for the world to take in and has served as the editor on his, uh, two of his books, Embodied Wisdom and Recently Hired Judo, and she's got a third one to tell us about coming up. Um, and currently is a, one of those highly involved trainers of Feldenkrais teachers and postgraduate programs, lives in San Diego with her husband, Rafael Nunez, Nunez and uh, he's a professor of cognitive science. So I'm pretty sure they have some interesting discussions at home. And then she has a teenage daughter, which always adds a little spice to life. So. I also want to let you know that Elizabeth will be leading an Awareness Through Movement lesson uh, later in our time together, so you can look forward to that for those of you who are actually just here for the movement, and that's all you're here for. It's going to happen in this one. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Cynthia. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. Good, good. It's good to have you. And uh, I think, you know, you have kind of an interesting background. We talked a little bit about this before, and I'd like to hear from I know, I know everyone will want to hear how you got involved in Feldenkrais and in martial arts. It's, a, it's an interesting beginning. Okay, I'll start there. Um, I uh, got involved with both of them relatively young. It's maybe a little different path than a lot of other people. Uh, I uh, was a voracious reader as a child, and I remember saying to my parents, you know, I'm reading about all these people having adventures, and when am I going to have an adventure? And by, when I got to be a teenager, I had a little more agency, and I started having adventures. And teenagers having adventures is not always the best thing. Um, I uh, got myself into some dicey situations. And um, one, I had a pivotal moment after, you know, a rocky time, let's say, where I was hiking in the Colorado Rockies by myself on a three-day hike. And uh, there were no people around, and I was enjoying myself. And uh, at a certain point, there was a peak in front of me, and I thought, I'll take a shortcut. This, that doesn't look like the best way to go. I mean, who made these trails, right? So off I went on this shortcut, and I found myself at a certain point climbing a rock face, Hope, luckily, I was pulling my backpack up and not didn't have it on, and it fell, and it fell many stories down. And I, I sat there on that rock for a long time, seeing myself down there at the bottom and thinking, you know, if I stay on this path, um, that I could be down there with that backpack, and I really need to think about this need I have to be in dangerous situations. And, you know, what is it about? 
And I thought about that. I mused on that. Of course, I thought about it for most of the rest of the hike. And you know what? It, this 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 excitement. I wanted a kind of excitement. I wanted to be on the edge, and I wanted to, this kind of presence, being alive, feeling alive. And that's part of what I felt when I was, on, you know, on the edge more in these situations that I'd been searching out. So that kind of led me to think I really need to look for other ways to feel like this. And that really led me pretty directly. Within a year, I was deeply involved with both Feldenkrais and uh, the martial arts. At that time, I was 18 when I was on that uh, trip. And uh, by I met Moshe when I was 19. And uh, it never had occurred to me that quiet, small movements could be exciting. Uh, but the atmosphere was so sparkly and full of things I'd never thought about before. And the experiences um, were, I think I couldn't have imagined when I asked myself that question, but that's one of the places I found myself. And of course, martial arts was a, was a natural kind of uh, direction for me, which I really got involved with after my first year of training with Feldenkrais, Dennis Leary, who was, many of you in the Feldenkrais community will know Dennis, he introduced me to my first uh, serious Aikido teacher in New Mexico, Masahilo Nakazono, and his son, Katsuharo Nakazono. And I trained with them for five years in, in New Mexico. And it was, yeah, in, in the training, Moshe would throw people and, he had there, you know, there was an Aikidoist in the training that he would throw and he would connect it to what we were learning. And it all, the two, the two paths really wove together for me. It made um, something yeah. incredible sense for you. Yeah. And so I love that description, sparkly. I've never heard anyone describe our word as sparkly before or our word as sparkly before. That's very lovely. And, um, and I kind of have been curious because in today's training environment, we uh, tend to see mostly people that are in their middle age and retiring, at least that's my experience at the trainings I've, I've been exposed to. And so I've always been fascinated by all of you who started out in San Francisco, San Francisco with him. You were in San Francisco, correct, right? I started in San Francisco and I, I finished in, uh, in Amherst. And Harris, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, th th that many of you were quite young. And uh, of course, I mean, I know it was a particular kind of time in society as well, but uh, I've, I'm, I'm fascinated with how people at that age could find the work as fascinating as I did when I was in my mid thirties and, you know, kind of really kind of going through a, a, the beginning of a midlife shift. Uh, so sparkly's very neat, very, very lovely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I don't think I've actually heard before that Moshe was uh, demonstrating martial arts moves in the San Francisco training. I, I think that's a new inf piece of information for me. Yeah, yeah, he was definitely, he'd related to the ATM we're doing or certain principles that we were, he was talking about, yeah. I was the youngest person in the, in the San Francisco training and I think part of what was exciting for me was all these interesting people also that were in the group at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was all packet, a whole package. So yeah. even though you had a tendency to want to take risk, you somehow found something in the Feldenkrais work that gave you a sense of, did it give you a sense of risk taking or did it give you a sense of modulation or? I'd say, I'd say that um, there is that when you really confront elements about yourself and your habits, that that feels risky sometimes. Sometimes it's very smooth and safe, and sometimes it can it can be. I mean, I had some big experiences when I first was immersed in the work, and um, you know, you one could want to run away from that. But so in that sense, maybe. Uh, but I think it was more about the the landscape, opening up a whole landscape to me in myself, thinking about risk as something outside of me and this was more i mean excitement as something outside of me and finding it in in my inner landscape as well mm -hmm. 
Nice. So you trained with these two teachers. I'm sorry, I can't say their names. I'll let you maybe re-say them. Just fine. These two individuals are pretty interesting themselves that you trained with. Well, so I started, I started with them. It was a very serious dojo and I was, I was really lucky to find a, you know, a, a traditional Japanese uh, instructor, the two of them. And they stopped after five years, they closed their dojo. And I, uh, I moved to the Bay Area because that was really the heart of the Feldenkrais method at that time. And I wanted to be a part of that. Um, and I, I floated around looking for a place to train. And eventually I met my, um, my main Aikido instructor, who's Kazuo, Kazuo Chiba Sensei. And he's been, he was my instructor for more than 30 years. He lived in San Diego, actually. So I began training with him both in the Bay Area and down in San Diego. And along the way, just to recognize my lineage, I did have the um, opportunity to have a, a female instructor as my main instructor for two years, Lorraine Diane Sensei, and also uh, Ichiro Shibata Sensei up in Berkeley. So I've been fortunate to have really extraordinary teachers in Aikido. So this topic that you're um, helping us or the track that you're helping us address today is deeper teachings in the Feldenkrais method. So what does martial arts have to do with these deeper teachings? How did, how did we, how do we come up with this idea? Yeah. yeah. Well, so first of all, I want to say that my expertise is really in Aikido and in say more generally, the Japanese arts. I can't make generalizations about all the martial arts in the world because there are really so many of them and they arose in a lot of different cultures. But one, one thing we could say is that martial arts are engaged with self-defense and survival. And in, in that context, that, that would be a universal among the martial arts. And so there's certain things we can say that, that would apply to, to most of them. It's interesting if you listen to the stories that Feldenkrais tells and the explanations he gives, especially, for example, in the Amherst training, you'll see he often goes back to survival situations to explain a way that we're organized in, in our optimum development. And that, I think, is um, a, a, an intersection of a martial arts concern with uh, a concern of ours. So we can, we can start with, well, let me just say about that. When you're, when you're thinking about how we evolved and how we evolved to, to function in a dangerous world, those same principles are the same, the principles we need to function in the world today in a healthy way and to, to feel well in ourselves. It's just a different kind of application. So um, one, of the, one of the first principles I would uh, talk about in this regard is the readiness for action. So Feldenkrais, I think, did a brilliant thing and he took the word posture and he changed it to acture. So posture comes from post and the image if you, the people listening want to think about it for a moment, what is the image you get when you think about the word posture? It has an idea of straightness. Actually, nothing in the human body is straight. It all has these beautiful functional curves. Um, and it's not, it doesn't imply movement. It implies a position, which is also has the same root. So acture means the ability to act. And that's what we're interested in in the Feldenkrais method. We're interested in your ability to act dynamically in the world. So that, that plays out, that, that's a, a switch where we come up with different kinds of solutions. So we want to see people be able to move in, in many directions without preparation. Um, and so just to give an example, many people come to me in my practice and they're concerned about the fact that they're asymmetrical. So I have a scoliosis or my chiropractor says, you know, my, this hip is this way and that hip is that way, or I feel different on my two sides. And that is not per se a concern of ours in the sense that we're, 
everybody has asymmetries. And what we want to see is that people can function symmetrically. So what I want to be able to do is if something, an earthquake were to happen right now, I could move to my left, I could move to my right, I could go under the desk. What, whatever I need to do, I'm ready to do it. I'm, I'm in a position where I'm ready to act. And that intersects with some of the classical ideas about posture, actually. So in that sense, I don't have to be symmetrical. I just have to be able to move. And that actually leads us, that way of thinking leads us to people feeling more comfortable and feel, sensing themselves in a more symmetrical way that is uh, more satisfying for them. But it's not, we're not correcting them. Okay, so, it, it, I mean, I think this is really key. You've just drawn a distinction between the ability to move in any of these directions, which we often talk about them as the cardinal directions, and they're talked about that way in lots of fields, uh, including Feldenkrais. Uh, you, and normally we do talk about that a lot in relationship to posture in a lot of fields. And what you're saying is that somebody could have, in fact, many people, everybody pretty much, has some level of asymmetry, and that does not preclude their ability to necessarily move uh, well in all the directions. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It doesn't. And, and if you think about it, many people have injuries. They're never going to be symmetrical. They have, they, I mean, I, you have a practice, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. I work. Oh, with I got people. injuries. So. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know, they're, they're fused on this side or they have artificial that, that on this side or they're missing a limb, but you can still function symmetrically. You don't have to function the same. It's just you can move in all the different directions. So it, it's, it's a much more, I think, optimistic view. So many people come to me with a problem they don't need to have. So I said, I've done, I, somebody came to me recently I've worked with a chiropractor for two years and who's been, you know, working on straightening my spine. I said, well, what, what brought you to want to straighten your spine? And he said, well, you know, I was having, I was having, you know, pain in my leg when I was, was walking and the chiropractor thought it was coming from my spine. Fair enough. Fair enough. But, and I said, so how do you feel walking? He said, a little bit better two years, a little bit better, you know? And really, um, they'd never worked with this individual on their actual walking. So. So it, in, in um, martial arts, obviously, since it's interested in, uh, often interested in self-defense, not necessarily, but a lot of martial arts are interested in self-defense, then the ability to move at, uh, spontaneously in any direction becomes really important. So if you, if you have to stop and think about what you're going to do, that gives somebody else a huge advantage. So in the, and so, it, and so Feldenkrais definitely had a similar idea for survival. Maybe, and maybe that came from judo. Maybe he just came from his background of all of his years and dealing in a, in a sometimes very hostile world. Um, so it's uh, this, this place then that people can come from is it's not, if it's not from their structure, then it's from their habit. It's, it's from their. Well, well, it, I'm not going to say that structure is irrelevant. You have no. to work, you have to work with your structure, but it has to do with, the neuromuscular patterns of, of action that they, that's, that's, they've evolved through the experiences of their life, the opportunities they've had to develop their abilities, the injuries that they've had. You watch young children who haven't had a, you know, a major obstacle and they, they can easily move in, in different directions. Which, would you say that movement is mostly instinct unless you are, have a need to really plan it out? Mo you know, you see some people have to like really motor plan almost every move and we can see how difficult that is. But 
I don't think very much at all, except I've been trained to think about it. it, right. it if I want to slow down, I can think about it, but I don't think about how I'm reaching for that glass or handling my ink pen or how I'll get up from this interview after afterwards. Right. So that's a, it's a pretty deeply biologically unconscious process that's fairly ingrained. Yeah. I mean, certainly it's not functional for us to be micromanaging how we move in our daily life. But the, um, if you, that it's an interesting, it's an interesting distinction there between I expect, I expect to be able to get up and be thinking about something else, but we don't want to be absent from our, absent from our physical experience either, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, that, that presence, that mindfulness of um, experiencing, having uh, some of your attention on your, your moving self, I think is also quite important. Because when people are absent, they're really some, completely somewhere else that also can, um, is not ideal, I think. So ready for action is a combination of um, having explored uh, your movement patterns enough that you have more options. You aren't just stuck with one way of doing anything and then some kind of ability to attend to oneself in the moment. I, I think so, yeah. I think so. Okay, so we've got and the first. I, I think there's a there's another element there that'll that we'll explore a little in the ATM I'm going to do, and that is um, spatial awareness and awareness of the space around you. So, too much awareness on yourself, and you're not. If you think in a martial sense, you 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 need to know what's going on around you if you're living in a dangerous world. Too much spatial sense, and you can stay in a position too long and injure yourself. So there's a balance there. Great. So that's um, our first principle that you wanted to talk about. I think you've yeah. got more. Yeah. Um, I want to say here, um, well, maybe we'll go through the principles and I'll, I'll come back to it. I want to talk about higher judo a little bit. Um, yeah. So the um, another big principle that we share with the martial arts is uh, using the large muscles um, to support the periphery. So in, in martial arts, we're concerned with generating power. And in order to generate power, you really, we talk about moving from the center. In Feldenkrais, we talk a lot about using the large muscles. We can talk about moving from the center as well. So just if you haven't thought about this, what part of what this means is if I isolate my arm, I have a certain amount of, of strength. And really, for example, myself, my arms are not particularly strong by themselves, but sometimes people are shocked at what I can lift and what I can move. And that's because I'm used to doing that for my keto and Feldenkrais has totally reinforced that. So using my whole self and moving from those strong muscles is second, is second nature to me. And it's easy to say it, but it's it is a practice to apply it in many, many situations. And that's part of the, in, in Japanese martial arts, you have Aikido, the Do is a path. It's a way of self um, development. And I think, you know, Feldenkrais work, it's the same thing. You have a principle and you keep working with it over time and refining it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that's extremely important and I, I'm no, I'm no martial artist, and I certainly don't consider myself strong, but one of the things that always surprises me is the men that I work with prescribing me as strong, and, and that's just because of how I use my body in relationship to them. It um, always fascinates me that that's how that translates to them when I think it's just efficient action. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, and... In our practices, the way this shows up is, in many cases, people are isolating. They're isolating parts of themselves, especially the arms from the trunk, but really you can see it in, in every kind of way so that the, the flow of using uh, the whole self to support an action is not there, and so individual joints are, um, are getting strained. So that shift in the Feldenkrais method where we go from looking at the joint that's in pain to the whole movement um, really helps us come up with other solutions, which are really the at, at their core coming out of that um, very, very 
uh, joined, let's say, with the martial arts perspective. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Yeah, go on. Okay, so there's that one. And um, the, uh, I think, uh, an interesting one, uh, if we think about the development of the method, so Feldenkrais spent a lot of time doing judo, and judo is a ha, judo and aikido ha, share in common that you have partners interacting with each other. So you are is a grappling art. You're you're um, you're grabbing, you're moving, etc. It means that you uh, are you have to be able to sense through the person's skeleton where their balance is because in Aikido and in Judo, we're, we're, a big concern of us is how a person is balanced because we want to unbalance them. So that's, we're all about unbalancing them. So we're looking for what we talk about in martial arts as an opening. The opening means a place where they're, they're vulnerable in some way. And that also relates to if somebody is in in the martial context if they're if they're the attacker and you know they have certain asymmetries they like to be on one side more than another side they they can turn more easily one way than another way as the more um advanced the person is the more they can sense that in their opponent so if we think about moshe uh developing functional integration he had that ability and he had that ability to sense through people's skeletons. And that is something that um, we really utilize in the practice of the Feldenkrais method. And, you know, just came, I think, very directly from Feldenkrais's uh, practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, I hadn't thought about it in that context at all, to be honest, before, but it makes sense that his original attunement to that really came from his martial arts background. Um, and the idea that he translated that into the functional integration practice is intriguing to me. Yeah. It's I, a good way of thinking for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, with, with this discussion, you can look at it, how martial arts came into Feldenkrais and you can look at, how Feldenkrais can inform martial arts because I've also, you know, taught martial artists. And so of course the kinds of distinctions that we make about where people's balance is or how they can turn one way. And they, maybe they're, they're always presenting themselves in a slightly asymmetrical way. That um, is also very interesting and useful going in the other direction as well. Very relevant for martial artists. Sure. Great. Comes and goes back to being able to, to move in any direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Carry on. Good. So uh, another, another principle I think is uh, reversibility. So that was a big, when Feldenkrais talked about what is a well-organized movement, uh, that was one of the principles that he uh, would highlight. And what we what we mean there is if i start to get up and then i and then then i see something that i need i can go in this direction it's a, it's related to being able to move in any direction but it's also being able to have a choice at any moment um you know when you when you when you talk about it, that it comes back to that whole idea also of awareness and presence is to have a choice at any moment in, in your movement, it, you're, um, you do need a certain awareness of what you're doing and, and presence in yourself to have those kinds of changes. So it's, it's, it's one of those, the, those abilities that, again, develops over time. Um, in, uh, I'll refer again to my um, good friend and colleague, Dennis Leary. So... We talk about reversibility and we talk about it as a, a central quality of well-organized movement. And when you see somebody who's really clumsy, exactly what they don't have sometimes is that reversibility. Um, because when they start to bang into something, they can't move back. And I'm not, I'm not here to claim that I'm perfectly uh, 
evolved in any of these things, but I'll give you an example of reversibility. I teach ATM all the time. I'm in rooms with a lot of people and they take off their glasses and they put them on the floor. Now, if I was, you know, a fully realized person, I would not step on those glasses, <laughs> but I do, but I've never broken one because I start, I feel the glasses and I'm able to pull my foot back. So I'd say that's the, the reversibility there is, you know, that I have some choice, even though I have, there's room for improvement <laughs> in my spatial awareness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that one has always seemed like an obvious one out of martial arts that he brought into the work. And I think we don't see reversibility as, as something stressed in very many other uh, outside of martial arts and outside of Feldenkrais. I don't see it as something that's stressed in very many other uh, approaches, maybe in dance. Yeah. Um, a little, although they wouldn't call it that, but uh, in dance. And I, I think also uh, in Feldenkrais, um, we've not, we don't, uh, I don't know that we ever talk about this, but I think clearly he was also looking for reversibility in thought because he was continually um, surprising, it sounds like, uh, from the transcripts of all the original you know, trainings, that he was continually surprising you all with uh, completely changing what he said and in ways that often were, would feel bizarre or even offensive. Um, and he had no difficulty doing that without being bothered um, by that. So there's a kind of reversibility in his thinking. Yeah, I think so. And I think um, that probably was partly um, developed, you know, through his, his family and, his, and, and through the uh, traditions in the, the Jewish religion. Um, and then he, he certainly uh, kept developing it. I was fortunate to, um, af in the uh, early 80s, to go and spend time with him in Israel. And I had a, a lot of time even just alone with him talking. So um, I think that, you know, I, I, was, I was in my mid-20s at the time, and uh, I was full of... Uh, um, naive and um, optimistic ideas. And uh, I think that he really just was entertaining himself, taking the opposing view. Whenever he saw that I would just say something, um, he would start to argue with me about it. And I had to get on board. At first I was a little taken aback because I felt like he was sometimes arguing against his method. So, but, you know, he, he just, so at, I had studied some acupuncture and he studied some acupuncture. And uh, so I was, oh, you know, we've got this in common. This will be great. We can talk about it. He goes, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if it works. What makes you think it works? You know, and then he just, he wanted to just get in there and have a good argument with me. And I, I, I eventually, I, I got there and I enjoyed it. And I'll tell you, I was, I was saying one time about, oh, you know, well, one of the things I, I experienced spending time with him was thinking that I didn't slow down enough to really experience the older people in my life and their wisdom because I respected him so much. I was spending that time with him and I think that changed me. And I said something about, you know, older people and so valuable and I don't know what I said. And he said, yeah, I think it's just like, just like the Eskimos do, just put them out on the ice and leave them there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as soon as you say something that you think yeah. you will be able to agree yeah. with. Yeah, so I, I really was a much better, I could pivot in the way, you know, in, in martial arts, we're always pivoting. I could pivot much better after I left that uh, time with him in Israel, I gotta say, mentally, yeah. Well, one of the ch challenges, uh, certainly for me, is not to get so invested in the way that I think that it becomes very personal to entertain thinking differently, right? I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's been a huge theme in my life. And uh, besides a therapist that uh, 
you know, was really bold enough to just totally send, send me on the edge around my thinking many times. I do think the Feldenkrais method has been very valuable in shaking loose just this idea that there's like one way or structure or whatever to see the world. I, I, it's an incredible, it's an incredible process for understanding the vast diversity of uh, the world and the human experience. Yeah. And I, I think the, the ways that our physical transformation interplays with our emotional and mental transformation is, is non-predictable and mysterious. So one of the things that I, um, that I've experienced is when I'm, I'm in deep in a powerful ATM and sometimes I'll, I'll come up with a new solution to something that I was, was worrying about or was working on, something about that the way that I have transcended some habits or shifted into another, another way of thinking, and then all of a sudden, I'm not, I wasn't even thinking about it and I have the solution. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Is now a good time for you to lead us in a little bit of an awareness through movement? And those, for those of you who've been listening, ATM is, and that, that aren't familiar, ATM is the shorthand version of awareness through movement that we often use. Yeah, I think it's the perfect moment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in a, a Feldenkrais class, normally um, the teacher's not going to be demonstrating. I might give you a, a few clues. But basically, it's going to work nicely if you close your eyes and just listen to my instructions. So you want to find a, a chair to sit on. Um, ideally, your uh, knees would be either parallel with your hips or um, your hips would be a little higher than your knees. And uh, so that you, you, you're free to move. And then just close your eyes. And sit for a moment. And notice the area that you're sitting on, the area of your hips and pelvis. And apropos what we were just talking about, you can feel if you have more weight on one side than the other side. And if there's some difference between the two sides that, that uh, you observe. Now, without opening your eyes, Notice your, the, the sense of space to the left and right of you. Just feel the space around you and notice, is one side of the room you're in more vibrant or somehow you, it's more clear to you than the other side? It's an interesting thing that many people, many people can observe is that even with their eyes closed, they're more aware of the space on one side than the other side. And we'll, we'll, we'll track that, we'll come back to it. So now, <clears throat> open your eyes, open your eyes, and we'll just do, do a, a simple action of reaching. So think that as if there's something on a table that was just out of your reach, and you reach kind of diagonally forward, kind of a 45 degree angle here, both sides. Now, close your eyes and do the same thing, and see which one feels more inviting to you, which one feels smoother to you. Most everybody will have a difference between the two sides. It might be a small difference, it might be a bigger distance. Notice particularly how your weight shifts on one side and the other side. And just stop for a moment with your eyes closed and just notice was there any relationship between the side of the room that was more present for you and the side you could reach to more easily. Many of you will notice that it's the same. The thing is, it's never gonna apply to everybody. So you just respect whatever your experience was and we'll, we'll go on. Okay, keeping your eyes closed, imagine that in front of you, there's a clock. And so you have 12 is up and six is down, three to the right, nine to the left. And now just begin to move your nose from the middle over to the nine o'clock and bring it back again. So that's just 
that's just a turning, a slight turning. Now, there are different ways you can do this. And notice, are you moving just your head? Are, are you moving your shoulders? Is something happening lower down? Don't change what you're doing, just notice what you are doing. Now, initiate the movement from your shoulders. So you're gonna start by moving your shoulders and have your shoulders move your nose over to the left like that. So your head's just gonna kind of ride along with your shoulders. Now do the same thing, but just move your head. You feel the difference. This is, this is a more isolated movement. And then with your shoulders again, you feel what it's like when the, when the head is moved by the shoulders. Here I go, I started doing the movement. Keep your eyes closed. Rest for a minute. So in the Feldenkrais Method, we do a lot of resting. It's, a, just, it's really a pause to refresh and to refresh your attention. And then you start again, hope with, um, with an open, spacious attitude towards whatever's, whatever's next. So we'll do the same thing, except now, see if you can move your head by moving your legs and pelvis. So you would just, you see, how would you do that? You're gonna move your nose to the, the nine just by taking, twisting your pelvis a little and maybe taking your right knee forward. And now just pause again and rest. Now move your nose again to the, to the left and back to the center. And, and see if you have a different sense of how to do that now. Can you allow a, a feeling of your legs, your pelvis, your back as you move the, the nose like that? Move your head like that. And pause again. Close your eyes and sense the space to the left of you and to the right of you. And see if anything shifted. Of course, some of you may have felt that the left was more present before. Some of you may have felt the right was more present and some of you may have felt it was even. So what do you notice now? You weren't looking to the left, but many of you may feel that somehow you have more of a sense of space to the left of you than the right. Now, keep your eyes closed and <clears throat> actually open your eyes for a minute and just look up and down. Look up towards the ceiling and look down. You see what's involved in, in looking up and down like that. Which way is easier for you looking down or looking up? And now close your eyes again and move your nose to the left and then bring it down the side of the clock. Go from nine to eight to seven to six. Go up back to the middle of the clock and over to nine again. So you're basically going around the left lower quadrant of the clock. See if you can do that really smoothly and slowly. Notice if 
you're, some part of you is straining that doesn't need to strain. Can you breathe easily as you do that? Now, think about what we were investigating a moment ago. Is there some part of you that could support this action? Could, could you allow your shoulders just to slightly come along? What about your seat? Is if you have a sense that your seat can move a little, can that support the motion of the nose like this? And stop again. Let's take a rest for a moment. And notice now we've done mainly things to the left. Just notice how the, the weight is between the two sides of your pelvis. If you can sense your breathing and the volume of your breathing as you rest for a moment. And now reach out again with your left arm towards that table and just see how is that for you now? Is there anything different about that? We've just done a few things, but perhaps there's a little difference there. You can check the right side as well. Let's see. And then stop again in the middle, stop again in the middle. And <clears throat> now, before we, we're gonna start to do things on the right side as well. So before we do that, just again, sense the space around you to the two sides. If you wanted to, to get up and uh, which way seems more inviting to move to, to the left or to the right? And now with your eyes closed, begin to take your nose around the lower quadrant of the right side of the clock. So you're gonna go across to three o'clock, down around the bottom, up to the middle, and over to the right again. Let's see to do it as smoothly as you can. What's your impulse? Is your impulse to move just the head? Or do you start right out with having some support in other parts of you? See if you can observe yourself without judgment. There's nothing wrong with starting with the head. It's the only um, thing we, we, if it's always like that, then that's a habit and you wanna have other options. Now stop again for a moment. And now reverse the direction. So go in whatever direction that you were going, um, you go the other way. I think we went down to six first. No, we went, we went across first. So now go down to six first and up the other way. And just do it in the other direction. As you do that, see if, again, you can allow a little bit support from your legs and gradually let your, how could your legs and your pelvis actually be moving your head? And you can experiment. There's not one right way to do that. So figure out how can, how can you move your pelvis, maybe taking your left knee forward a little to or pulling your left knee back. How could you initiate this from lower down? Keep your eyes closed. Don't, don't try to copy what, what you're seeing on the screen. You have to do it in your own way. Now just leave that and rest again. Yeah.
Now, <clears throat> now <clears throat> open your eyes and with your eyes open, just sense the space on either side of you. It's a little different than doing it with the eyes closed. Close your eyes again, sense the space. Is there a little more vibrancy on the, the, the right side now after working with the eyes like that? Now go all the way around the bottom of the clock. So you just do it in a way that's enjoyable, pleasurable for you. It could be very small. It could be a big movement. You take your, you go ac straight across from three to nine or nine to three, and then this nice swooping movement around the bottom. So your nose for goes down and goes straight across and then goes down again. See if you can do it three different ways. Keep going in the same direction, but emphasize your shoulders once. Maybe emphasize your legs once. You see, what, what are three different ways you could do it? Now pause for a moment. And then go the other direction. And continue, just play with different ways of making that you're just looking, look for what's the smoothest way to do it. Keep experimenting until you feel like that feels good. I really like that. It could be that doing it smaller, you're more satisfied with the quality. In the end, what we want both in Feldenkrais and in, in, um, in many martial situations is we want minimum effort for um, maximum gain, maximum um, move, maximum power really in the martial context. So sit in the middle again, just rest for a moment with your eyes closed. Now you've, you've moved in different ways. See if, is there a sense, a different sense of the space around us? A lot of times in Feldenkrais lessons, we are really looking at shifts in movement and we'll do that in this lesson too, but you can also see how there's a relationship between what you're, how you're sensing the worlds around you spatially and um, how you're moving. So now open your eyes and look up and down again. Now, some of you may notice that it's easier to go up or down. Interesting thing there is you might, you might think it's not um, remarkable because we were looking and moving down, but we never looked up, did we? And uh, how does that work? That that, for many people, will have gotten easier also. Love that. Mm -hmm. yeah those kinds of surprises in the method. And now with your eyes open, just reach again, one towards that, that table there, 45 degrees one way and the other way. And just see if that's gotten any more pleasurable, more easy. If there's something a little more dynamic in your seat. And uh, we'll end here. Thank you. I definitely felt like I was going up a little bit over a hill when I reached to the left in the beginning, and that's a much smaller hill now. <laughs> Very good. And it is uh, interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm in a space where there's a lot of space on one side and, and a wall fairly close on the other side, but very interesting to feel how they started to feel more equalized, even though there's 30 feet on one side and maybe four or five on the other. So it, it, it's an interesting thing that you raised that our perception of ourselves uh, on how we're using ourselves is also affecting our perception of the space, our experience of the space around us. You could say yeah. those are two separate things perhaps, but. Yeah, that, that, that the perception and the action are really intertwined and uh, 
we didn't really get into it in depth, but also we have habits in how we move our eyes and that very much affects both the perception and the action. And the, the eyes are just often really key there. But you bring up an interesting point and it's really true. We are certainly affected in that by the space around us. If we're next to a wall and then there's a beautiful vista on one side, surely our attention's gonna be drawn towards that vista. You know, so well, you, you, would, you know, it was interesting to feel that because I felt like actually I was more interested in what was on the right. And that has to do with the fact that I, my, uh, it was much easier for me to also shift to the right, I, I believe. But I felt very spacious and airy on the left, you know, because I think because of the space around me. So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing you can play, you know, everybody can play with and be That's careful right. about. That's right. Yeah. Can you um, connect us to some of uh, Moshe's martial arts writing? Yeah. So I, um, I brought here uh, Hired Judo, which is, um, he wrote a number of uh, judo books. Hired Judo is the last one that he wrote. And he wrote it at a time where he was al already uh, starting to develop the method. And those of you in the Feldenkrais community who haven't read the introduction to higher judo, it's really essential reading. And people in the martial arts who um, are interested in the Feldenkrais method, I would say the same thing. Because he, he talks about judo as an essential uh, educational activity for humans, saying this is something all humans should do because what you learn is so fundamental. And I, I know because he said it and because I talked to him about it when I was in Israel, but that he realized that he was people, you know, the majority of people were never going to join a judo dojo and it was not for everybody. And really part of the impetus for his method was thinking how else could people have these experiences and, and learn these things that I think are so fundamental. And Around about the same time, he wrote Body and Mature Behavior. So this, he has his idea of adult maturity, where people develop in uneven ways. And we all know people like that, and we all, in fact, are probably like that to some extent ourselves, but where they can be extremely mature in their profession, but very immature in another way, or any combination that you can think of. So his idea was, that his method would help people um, develop those parts of themselves that were not fully matured and that judo did the same. Uh, so he really, he, he says judo helps further adult maturity. So that you see that intersection in his view of the two practices. Mm -hmm. This light on me, I don't know. Uh, that's just changing, changing time, time of day. That's right. So, um, and also you have been working on a new release of one of his classic books, actually my favorite that, one of his. That's right. So the last book that Feldenkrais wrote was The uh, Elusive Obvious, and um, it was published by a, a small publisher, and I think didn't maybe get the distribution that it, it could have, even though they were well-meaning. Um, and we, um, a group of us, uh, especially David Zemak Burson and Carol Kress and I, we, we work to get a new edition out and we were able to get Norman Doidge, uh, the uh, neuroplasticity maven, shall we say, to do a forward uh, and really put it in the context of um, the, you know, more up-to-date scientific uh, thinking about neuroplasticity and change today. So here it is. And I think it has not, been released yet, but by the time anybody sees this, it will have been released. It's scheduled for uh, April 23rd. There it is. Fantastic. So, uh, yes. yeah. And and it will be re available through uh, Feldenkrais Resources and will it, it be, will be available? Time? It'll be available through Feldenkrais Resources. And I also, um, of course, we want you to get it through Feldenkrais Resources, but I also really encourage you to get it, uh, order it from your local bookstore. Say, it's a great new book. Why well, carry it? Please order it at your public library. Create some buzz around this. So I'm going to plug. I'm going to plug my uh, website now. There uh, it is. Get it real close because the light is really 
fooling with it. So it's Feldenkrais. Oh, there we go. Perfect. FeldenkraisResources.com. Right. That's my website. And there, if you're interested in more fully formed ATMs, there's lots of my ATMs and a lot of other really wonderful Feldenkrais practitioners and, and their work as well. Yes. Yeah. So she has a, a ton of resources there and I uh, definitely recommend it. I've ordered many things over the years and for all varieties of uh, people. Elizabeth, I've been asking people uh, before we wrap up, how would you like to change your own personal map or the map of your work or field? We are exploring the map is the territory, which is a kind of provocative turn on the original fa uh, phrase of the map is not the territory. So how would you like to expand, expand in some way? Well, I, I think um, in a certain way, uh, my problem is sometimes too much expansion. I have lots of ideas and uh, not always the uh, full commitment and time to actualize them. So I think uh, editing maybe, maybe mm -hmm. uh, focusing in more deeply in a few things rather than trying to do everything. Well, you and me both, sister. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. like that right there is one of my life works right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's 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 good it's good to think big, and I really appreciate I really appreciate what you've done here, Cynthia. It's uh, it's a big big undertaking, and it's very sparkly. Oh, very sparkly. That's <laughs> fun. Um, so, if you want to remember, Arlene has already put over in the chat for you the FeldenkraisResources.com, and uh, she might have even popped a link in there to the book. It's possible. She's usually pretty good about stuff like that. And if uh, you want to find this information later, you like think, uh, I remember that gal, she was talking about martial arts, I don't know her name, you just go to FeldenkraisSummit.com, you look for the title of the, of the talk, or you see the picture because you can remember what she looked like, you click on her name and you will find all kinds of information about Elizabeth as well as her website there. So you don't have to be panicked if you are not able to remember. Uh, all these places and that, that website will not go anywhere anytime soon. So you'll be able to find it later and still reconnect even many days after the summit. We left it up for a whole year last time. So I don't have any reason to change that this time. Also, uh, as we wrap up here, this uh, talk should be up within a couple of hours and then it'll be available as a replay for 48 hours at no charge whatsoever. And uh, we're getting ready to go, of course, to the panel discussion immediately following this with uh, Alan Quistel and Donna Ray and myself. Tonight, we will start a new track with John Sharkey, who I feel Moshe Feldenkrais would have been fascinated to know and talk with and maybe argue with a little bit if he were alive. And uh, I'm super psyched about that interview because I think it expands our map. Uh, as Feldenkrais and uh, human beings in an, in an interesting new way. Actually, if you're in any kind of human development field, I think it, it's, a, it's an interesting talk. And then after that, we'll have Dorothy ending out our day with another Awareness Through Movement lesson. And I, so you've gotten a lot of variety and lessons already. We're a little more than halfway through the summit in between Arafili and uh, this lesson that you led, Elizabeth, I think is really a nice, difference for people to explore the space around them and make such a great connection to martial arts. And then Dorothy's been leading some nice relaxing things in the evenings for us. So we're going to get ready here to sign off so that we can sign back on. So get up, go uh, take a break, grab something to drink. I hope you come back and join us for the panel discussion. Elizabeth, a pleasure, a really big pleasure. Good to have you. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.